Hello, everyone, and welcome to our March edition of Autism BC Talks. Uh, we're very lucky to be able to have Gabrielle with us today to talk about Girls Have Autism 2 and social skills. Uh, if this is the first time that you're joining Autism BC Talks, what we do is we find uh, an expert in the field that follows one of our monthly themes, and uh, we pose a number of questions to our membership. And then we share those questions with our presenter, uh, and our presenter can help answer some of the questions and direct us to local resources uh, that are around. So if you have questions during this presentation, it's really for you. Uh, if you're able to type them into the chat box, then uh, we'll pass those on to Gab and she can see if she can answer those for us. Uh, for those of you who are not following our social media, uh, there have been, is it two, two or three different profile breakdowns of you that have come up? <laughs> I'm not sure. I haven't been able to keep track. I think there's uh, been a couple. Yeah. So there's some photos. Thank you. There's, there's a little <laughs> bit of some bio on uh, who you are and why you moved into this field and why you decided to be able to focus uh, on girls. So after you graduated from the University of Victoria, uh, you moved on to working as a BI. Mm -hmm. And uh, during your work as a BI, you realized this you were very passionate about that type of work and moved to the UBC where you completed your master's and then started your private practice in 2015. Uh, you started a social girls group in 2017, which I'm sure we'll hear more about uh, yeah. during this presentation. Um, yeah. So thank you so much All for right. being able to come. And we've asked uh, a number of questions that came through the membership. One was the importance of establishing female relationships. What is a female relationship? What are some of the challenges that autistic girls face? And what are the areas of focus when teaching girls? And then how can we support girls with finding friends? So I know that you have created a little bit of a PowerPoint here to be able to answer those questions. And I think the easiest yeah. thing to do for people that have tuned in right now uh, is we'll let you kind of run through the presentation. And then if anyone has questions, they can type them in and I can speak the questions in. Okay, perfect. Thank All you, right. Autism BC, for having me. Um, so yeah, as Brock mentioned, I started a girls group. Maybe I'll just start with that piece. <laughs> Um, in 2017. Um, prior to that, I was running a social group that included both boys and girls. And I just started to notice a difference in the participants. Um, I noticed the, uh, different interests, different um, ways that kids were participating. And I found that girls uh, were noticing a bit more their challenges and their differences and asking questions about friendships. So at the time, I happened to have a few girls on my caseload that had similar cognitive and communication abilities. So we started a girls group, and um, it's grown. And um, yeah, I've been there. They were tweens. They're now teenagers. It's pretty fun to have. I'm learning a lot from them, and they're teaching a lot to me. Um, I've recently been able to start a, a younger girls group again, too. However, with homeboundness it's kind of changed um, how that's going to look so maybe we could talk a bit about that at the end to help support lots of families that are stuck at home right now so um, let's start talking about social skills so oh how do I change okay there we go so as Brock mentioned this is what we're going to discuss today I'll go through each slide and then um, pause and Brock can let me know if there's any questions that come out of each of these slides. So let's start with talking about the importance of establishing female friendships. So adolescence is a critical time for everyone. There's lots of shifts in relationships, there's shifts in um, life in either attending middle school or high school. And this can be um, stressful for many children, but specifically um, this is a critical time for girls with autism. Uh, research has shown that they are at greater risk of experiencing or developing depression and anxiety. This is in compared 
comparison to neurotypical peers, um, both male and female, and also um, boys with autism. So it's really important to start establishing these friendships early in life to help with that transition so that the girls are feeling comfortable and, and less likely to develop depression and anxiety. Um, there's definitely, I won't go too much into it, but I'm sure many of you have noticed there's changes in peer dynamics between boys and girls. Um, boys tend to be a bit more rambunctious. Their play, I wouldn't say is, is simpler, but a bit more um, <laughs> repetitive and relies more on physical uh, movement, so it's easier to copy, whereas female friendships tend to be a bit more in depth. So we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, so another piece of establishing friendships early in life is that it also provides more acceptance from peers of neurodiversity. So accepting those differences amongst their friends, because as probably we've all experienced as we've grown up in teenagers, this um, is, is less and less likely to happen. So if we can establish that early in life, then it'll transition on as teenagers grow. Um, consider supporting more than one friendship, because if that one friendship changes or ends, that could be really devastating. So helping your child, you know, even celebrating the moment they do find that one connection, but making sure that you're continuing to find other girls that they can connect with. You're not putting all your eggs in one basket, if you will. It's also important to establish female friendships because then girls can start learning what a healthy friendship is. Um, and I'll talk more about what this looks like later on of how this can put girls at risk. But learning to establish those healthy friendships early in life is gonna help you later on in life, either romantically or in work, to know, um, you know what's, what's a respectful relationship to be in so that you're not being taken advantage of or um, put into an abusive situation. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Brock, let me know if there's any questions. All right, so as I mentioned a little bit earlier, what's involved with female friendships? Um, female relationships are more interpersonal. They're focused on communication, emotions, um, gossip. It's, it's more related on interacting on that um, um, emotional and talking about friends and who's who. I know when I hang out with uh, my husband and his family, a lot of the male conversation is dominated around sports and who got traded and who's got stats and who won. Whereas female relationships are more based on their experiences on, you know, it could be even what they ate for breakfast and how they felt about it. So um, it, it is based on more of that higher level of interpersonal bit. Um, it's also recognizing me hearing what someone else has to say and empathizing and giving feedback on that, matching my emotion to that other person's emotion. Competitive, female relationships are competitive. This is about who belongs to which group, finding your place within the group. Um, a really great book, I don't know if you guys can see me, but a great book is, is this one. Um, it actually inspired the movie Mean Girls which I mean is, is a bit of a funny movie, but it really does in an exaggerated way demonstrate the power struggle and the competitiveness between the female friends of who's, who's on top, who's the, the boss, if you will, and, and then the sidekicks. Um, and it doesn't matter in regards to the popular group, but this happens amongst all groups of friends. So I think that in helping your daughter with autism on how to navigate this, it is helpful to understand what that friendship looks like amongst the neurotypical kids. Uh, conflict resolution. This is learning to agree to disagree, right? How many times have you gotten into an argument with a girlfriend and your friend's off for a couple of days and then a couple of days later your friend's on again? So if you've got a, a black and white thinker who thinks like, oh, we think differently, we disagree about this, we can't be friends, that's not always the case. Um, obviously, this becomes a little bit more easier as we grow older and we develop different interests, but we still maintain friendships. But when you're younger, it's, you're learning those basic foundation skills of 
Um, even though we're getting into an argument, how do we sort this out? How do we come out of it as friends again? Um, I mentioned this earlier about starting to determine what is a healthy friendship. What are those boundaries? Um, we know a lot of our girls are at risk of, of being taken advantage of, of, um, you know, oh, well, they're friends and they told me to do this, so I just did it, right? Not thinking over trusting people. So helping to understand if, um, if you know, they're a friend of me or they're a friend. Are they nice to me or are they not? And we'll talk, I'll talk more about um, how challenges for, for girls with autism might have a hard time in determining if that friend is a friend of me or not. So I'll pause there to see if there's any questions. I have to say it's really strange to be presenting and not getting like feedback <laughs> from other people. <sighs> All right. So some challenges that autistic girls face in making friendships. Um, though girls are physically developing the same as their peers, they may not be um, emotionally. And I'm just going to move this over. I can't see my whole slide. There we go. Socially and emotionally. So, um, you know, many girls, you may notice um, some of the girls are more into um, pop culture and movies, and maybe your daughter's still into My Little Ponies. So there might be some differences and in interest there. Um, some girls, as they grow older, are more likely to start talking about boyfriends and sex. And some of the girls are still in the um, Disney iconic relationships, right? Like every, you just hold hands and there's butterflies and hearts that float around you. So it's really, that is a barrier between making friends if you can't participate or um, are com uncomfortable with those levels of conversation. Managing sensory issues can be a challenge. Um, lots of girls with autism struggle with different sensory issues. So if the conversation or the environment is um, a focus because you're uncomfortable, it's going to be really challenging to stay focused on um, the conversation that's going on around you of what your friends are talking about. Or if your friends are planning to do an outing somewhere, but because of um, sensory overload, it's difficult for you to participate, you may not attend those events. So that's a barrier that could impact girls from continuing to develop these friendships. Internally, internalizing emotions, this is a really, a really big one that I've noticed with a lot of my girls. Um, a lot of challenges with understanding and recognizing those um, negative emotions, whether they be anxiety or um, sadness or fear or anger, one in recognizing that in yourself and how to, in a healthy way, um, share that and, and have output. Um, so many of the girls that I work with, you know, are considered not a problem in school because they're quiet and they listen and they follow instructions. But if there's something that's a problem, they are internalizing it. And then when they come home, it's a big meltdown or that's when things fall apart. So if, if girls are struggling um, socially and are focusing on, on, you know, keeping those emotions under control it's going to prevent them from recognizing what's going on around them or opportunities to socialize, and that may impact their ability to make friends. Social problem solving and conflict management. So I mentioned this earlier about um, agreeing to disagree. Um, again, it's, it's recognizing when, um, you know, how do you, how do you navigate those social challenges? What if your friends and two of your friends get angry and walk off in different directions? Who do you follow? Um, that might be a conflict that girls are experiencing. Or um, maybe the girls are skipping class. And well, if you have a daughter who's rule driven, you know, that's wrong. I can't do that. But it's going to impact her relationship with those girls if she doesn't. I mean, that's a bit of an extreme one, but, or even swearing, right? Um, there's, a, there's a point, children grow up knowing that they're not supposed to swear, but once you're at a certain age, that's kind of what you do with your friends. So if you have a child who's struggling with those changes in rules um, and can't participate, that's going to be a challenge. And that leads to conforming to group interests. 
so you know how many teenagers do you see and they have very similar hairstyles very similar outfits to one another um, because that's what's deemed as sort of what's in style so um, not even just with fashion but with I mentioned earlier, you know, maybe your daughter's still into watching My Little Pony while the rest of her friends are watching, um, you know, horror movies or whatever the, the biggest show is on TV. Um, that's going to be a challenge and that's going to impact her ability to it, participate in conversations, um, understand what's going on and keeping up with what's happening. Social cues, recognizing, interpreting and adjusting. So many of the girls that I work with struggle with those nonverbal cues, um, not just um, gestures, but also tone of voice. Um, if you're not understanding what that means, then you're gonna have a really hard time interpreting what the conversation is. I had um, one of my group participants, I said in a really sarcastic voice, oh, nice shirt. And she didn't understand that that was mean. Um, you know, it was, the words were kind, I was complimenting her. So helping girls understand what those really discreet and subtle social cues are. And girls are very good at being subtle, whether it's a glance to a friend or an eyebrow going up. I mean, I've, I've left dinner, dinner meet, or sorry, dinner outings with my husband. And I'm like, did you see how so-and-so looked at that person? And they raised their eyebrow and oh, you know, what do you think that means? What is going on? And my husband didn't notice any of that kind of thing. So girls are really in tune with what's happening and going on around them. And um, if you have a kiddo who's, who's not in tune with those pieces, they're, they're not going to recognize if they're being made fun of. Um, whether again, I go back to that front of me, if somebody, is being mean to them, um, but they're using nice words. So helping them understand those pieces. Slower processing time to hear and respond. Um, a lot of, again, especially group conversations. I've, a lot of the girls have told me it's really hard to keep up with a group conversation um, because by the time you hear and recognize what one person is talking about, there might be a slight shift in the conversation to what the next person is talking about. So if, um, if my friend Catherine starts talking about going to Disneyland and she went on all the rides and her favorite was Splash Mountain, and then I go to my friend Brandy and she's telling me, oh, yeah, I went on a, a roller coaster at the local theme park and I almost barfed. Oh, I hate roller coasters. And then it goes to my friend Shauna who's talking about, oh, when I was on the tea party, whatever that twirly ride is, somebody did barf on me. And then all of a sudden I participate and go, oh, I loved Crash Mountain <laughs> at Disneyland. And I, and I really like the balloons there. Well, the conversation has evolved that many steps that by the time I contribute, it's, it's mistimed. It might be almost considered off topic. So that can be a challenge for a lot of girls in keeping up with what's going on. Um, and even with group texting, I, I heard from a, another person I know who said group texting is really hard to understand because it's hard to keep up with, like, was that question to everyone? Was that question to one person in the group? Um, you know, I've missed three texts. Now I have to respond. Which one do I respond to? So that can be a challenge as well. Time management and planning. Um, again, thinking some of your girls might come home from school and they're like, oh, there's a school dance next week. I'm planning on going. Great. But then there's not that follow through. So by the time it comes to the school dance, yeah, I'm going to the dance. Okay, well, who are you going with? How are you going to get there? What's going to happen? And your girl might not have planned for all those details right? Where typically when girls are planning, or this is just an example, but when kids are planning on going to, to an event, they're talking about it weeks in advance. They're talking about who's going with who and how we're going to get there. Um, I have a kiddo that I participate who, who loves planning parties and she can tell you, oh, she plans the best party. She's got the decoration set. She's got the food, the menu decided. She knows who she's inviting but then she forgets to, to talk to her mom to organize it until the night before or forgets to tell people about it until the day before. So then the parties never happen because she hasn't provided enough time for other folks to plan for it. Um, I think certainly now it, it, you know, it's keeping up with your friends and, and um, 
girls are, by the time they're in their tweens, they're texting each other and making plans. Parents aren't doing that for them. So if you have a kiddo who isn't regularly on texting or communicating with her friends, she might miss out on those events and, and then not be able to plan for it in a, in a manageable way. Uh, social exhaustion, this is masking. I don't know if any of you know that term. So basically it's girls um, doing everything in their power to look normal so that they can fit in. Um, they may come home and just be exhausted and want to be alone. I have kids that just need a break and need to hide in their room and just listen to music, and, which is fine and that's what they need. But this is also going to impact their ability to socialize. How many kids, you know, go out after school, right? Oh, let's go hang out at the mall or go to the Starbucks and get something. But if your kiddo is socially exhausted and can't manage that, So I'm just, just to preface, I'm just going through like a brief summary of this. This you, you're, you might not identify the girl that you're knowing with these challenges. You might have something else that you see as a, a challenge for your kiddo. Uh, these are just more general um, based on research and what has been reported from the girls that I work with. And also I find a great resource for myself is following women with autism on Instagram and Facebook and hearing they have very generously shared their stories and their thoughts. So um, that's been really helpful for me in understanding the girls I work with. Any questions? I'm not here by myself, right? <laughs> um, Good morning. Good morning, Gabriel. Can you okay. hear me? Yes, somebody's there. Okay. Hi. Hi. I'm Diane. I'm Diane Washington. Hi, Diane. Uh, my, my husband and I are raising our 11 and a half year old granddaughter. Yes. A and one of the things she really has difficulty with is letting things go that have upset her. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have any words around that because she'll go back six months or a year or more and mm -hmm. say, remember when so-and-so did such and such, and it's weighing on her and making her sad, but she won't let it go. She's holding that grudge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really hard. Um, do you have a professional that you work with? We do. We have a, a counselor. We just started working, and of course, the, the virus has uh, put an end to that. Oh. Um, yeah, and she's had, we've had a home-based team with our BI and, um, you know, our uh, consultant for quite some time. Yeah. And everyone is aware of the issue, but when this comes up, I'm at home with her. It's not necessarily that our professional team is around. Right. And so I think that I, I can't give you an answer because I, I don't know the whole story and it's unethical for me to, to help you with that, but that certainly definitely is a, is a barrier for a lot of, for some girls. Um, my my suggestion would be for you, and we're going to talk a bit more about how we can support families through this. I'm doing a lot of um, this to help families um, and working one on one with children. So one suggestion I might have is see if your counselor is willing to do remote, um, like video conferencing with your granddaughter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the other piece I would suggest is is if your um, behavior consultant and team is still involved to get have them give you some tools of how you can support her um, they're not going to be in her life forever but it, you are so if you can have that be empowered to help her through these pieces to help her move on because you're going to be the one that's going to help her socially in, in that situation to move on right that would be my thank suggestion. You. okay thank you sorry I couldn't be more help that's okay. Thanks. Um, I'll just pause to see if there's any other questions before I move on. All right, so let's talk about the areas to focus on when teaching. And I'm just going to move my thing over so I can see. Okay, so um, so first piece is really working on that on the quality of the interactions. So I think that um, I've seen some schools. Um, try to teach girls scripts to follow. So 
So the challenge with scripts is that it doesn't provide a quality of interaction. It's, it's scripted. So it's, it's not going to be in the moment. It's not going to be, um, it's going to sound a bit insincere. So making sure that your daughter's understanding or your granddaughter, the girl that you're working with is understanding what's being said to her and how to respond. Um, and that could be, you know, matching the emotion. Um, it was the person who's saying something, I, and this came up in one of my groups, um, you know, one of the girls was sharing something that really was bothering her at school that day. And another participant um, made a comment, but didn't match her emotion. She was very happy and like, oh, let's do this. And so it sort of dismissed what the other child was saying. So making sure that um, kid, kiddos are listening and understanding how to respond to those situations. So, so that's what I mean by that quality of interaction. Interpreting social cues, verbal and nonverbal, and how to adjust. So again, I talked about this earlier about kiddos, my little, my, one of my kids not understanding sarcasm. So we, um, we targeted this in group. We, um, I think I posted it on my Instagram account. Um, we basically had one sentence, like, um, I, I, I'm going to her birthday party. And we would hide our face and say it in different tones of voice so that the kiddo had to decide if I'm saying it in a happy way because I'm excited to go to the birthday party or I said it in a sarcastic way. And then also cueing, well, why do you think, like what's that person thinking when they said it in a sarcastic? Why wouldn't they want to go to a birthday party? So that's one way to start to sort of work on that tone of voice. Um, Nonverbal, we've, we've done games where we're silent. Um, the girls understand what the outcome is and what they're supposed to do, but nobody's allowed to talk. It's all gesture based. So um, we've done making snacks where one girl has to make a pizza for the other girl um, and non-verbally gesturing to all the different ingredients to say like, oh, do you want this? Yes, no. Um, so we've done that. We've also played board games, certain board games, non, you know, without any talking. So that again, we're working on those, those social cues. And I've had families go home and do um, meals, like family style me meals where there's passing. Um, and have reenacted these activities in other ways. So that's one way to work on those. Um, the other piece is how do you adjust your behavior? So if, if you're um, maybe telling a story and, and it's going on and on and on, <laughs> and you sort of give that bored expression, teaching um, your, your daughter, granddaughter, how to respond, oh, I should stop and maybe ask a question back or you know, get, get my audience to be more interested in what I'm saying. Um, the next piece is addressing sensory needs and teaching self-regulation. So again, um, helping your daughter or granddaughter recognize what it is that's in the environment or on her that's bothering her and then giving her ways that she can self-regulate. So whether it's like it's too loud and, and, and too busy in this class, I need to go for a break. It's very appropriate to ask to go to the bathroom. Um, I have a kiddo who goes, we, she has an app that she uses to help with her anxiety levels. So she knows that she can, you know, ask to leave the class to go to the bathroom so that she can go in and focus on that app if she needs to. Um, headphones are really in style these days. So if, if sound is a challenge, you know, maybe just providing some of those headphones as a buffer. Um, sometimes clothing can be a real challenge for girls. I had one girl who only wore she wore the same pair of leggings over and over her mom finally had to like sew two pairs of leggings together <laughs> so that she could had a pair of pants obviously that's not gonna survive for the rest of her life so she, um she and her bi were able, they went shopping and they touched different fabrics to help her find other um, alternative clothing that she could wear um there's lots of other sensory needs out there but that's just a, a few Inferencing and oh, sounds like there might be a question about that. Nope, maybe not. Um, inferencing and social use of language. So again, understand the inferencing piece is really understanding what others are thinking um, and and what what their intentions are. Again, so you can adjust to that conversation. The social use of language. Are they using you know language in a in a 
in a way that might not be as you expected, so idioms, right? So not that black and white language, but understanding what they're inferencing or referring to. Um, understand emotions and emotion literacy. I came up with this, I uh, talked about this earlier, about a lot of my kiddos really struggling with their anxiety and really understanding um, how to manage when they're having feelings of sadness. Emotion literacy is, is being able to recognize that in your body, being able to communicate that effectively, um, and also being able to understand that and recognize that in, in others. I think this is a really big one, understanding her autism diagnosis and self-advocacy. The, the biggest piece that I have learned and have worked with the girls that I work with is I'm not trying to, to change them or normalize them. That's, that's not my goal and that's not what I want for them. But I want them to be able to really understand themselves so that they can self-advocate. So they can tell their teachers, you know what, I need extra time or this is too loud for me. I need to go to a quiet space to do my test. Or telling their friends, you know what, I can't come to that outing because that environment just really bothers me. Could we maybe just hang out at my house together? I'm more comfortable there. I think if they're able, if these girls are able to be honest about um, recognizing what they need and then being able to communicate that, I think it'll be more accepting. It'll be easier for a, a, a stronger foundation in friendships. Understanding what is friendship. Um, this is big. I've had lots of girls tell me, oh, so-and-so is nice to me, so she's my best friend. You know, there's a certain point of time and age when you can't throw that best friend um, label around loosely. It, it's, you will be made fun of. So really working with your, your daughter or your granddaughter, understanding the levels of friendship, right? There's, there's those people that we greet, there's um, acquaintances, and then how do those friendships evolve to becoming a best friend? And what is a best friend? Just because somebody sits next to you and talks to you in math class, she is not your best friend. So, um, you know, you're a bit of a, a killjoy there, but <laughs> it's, it's, you don't, you want to help your, your daughter, or your granddaughter understand what that give and take in friendship is. Again, it's understanding that healthy friendship and the boundaries. Um, last one I have noted here is having a key go-to person. So I think as girls get older and, and they're talking or, and I think this is good to instill when kids are younger, but having somebody that they're comfortable with and, and talking to about their problems. And this may not be their mother or their grandmother or their primary caregiver. Um, if it is, that's fantastic. I know when I was growing up, that was not my go-to person. Um, mine was my aunt, and that was my person that I went to to share my problems. So I think that um, it's making sure that your kiddo has that go-to person. Maybe, it, maybe it's an aunt. Maybe it's a family friend. Um, maybe it's an older sibling. But somebody, you know, finding someone who shares the same values with you, who you trust, and who um, your daughter her granddaughter trusts and, and can relate to. Oh, and I was going to share one more book about understanding autism. This is a fantastic book. Um, and I've used this with kiddos who are five to a 15 year old to help her understand. So it's got um, it's really broken up, lots of pictures. And then at the back, it's got a lot of really good parent information. Okay. Yeah. So, Could you give us the author's name? Yes, it's um, Danuta Bullhawk Patterson. If I hold it up, can you see? Yeah, we will link those yes. in to the end of the video. Danuta. That's great. Oh, thank you. That's uh, yeah. That was the question that came in. Like, where do you start with understanding self and self advocacy? Like, where do you start? How do you start? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, we, I started with a five-year-old the other day. She, she's little. Her parents um, were comfortable to move on. We just, I broke the book up, um, so we, would, we didn't want to overwhelm her with information, and we just started with one section at a time. And she's actually created her own All About Me Aspie Girl book, which she thinks that having autism is pretty awesome. 
Um, so yeah, her mom just texted me yesterday and showed me some pictures that she's added to her book. And, um, again, with that understanding of emotions, starting at a really early age, she was drawing pictures of this is me feeling sad <laughs> and this is what happened. So, um, that's where we started with that young girl, um, with an older girl. I, to be honest, I would, I, I do the same thing. I would go through the book, break it down, talk to her. Obviously, I would individualize it to each girl's needs. Um, one girl might be more journaling, you know, what are your thoughts on your autism and how does that make you feel? Um, within the social group, I haven't, I, I didn't bring it up, but one of the girls um, has brought it up in the group and started talking about her autism and how much she hated it. Um, she said she was embarrassed about it and she didn't want her friends to know. And it really threw me off because I didn't quite know how to <laughs> navigate that conversation. So, um, and the other girls had been quiet through it. And um, I, d I mentioned it to the family, to all the families. And it was great because they, they did give me follow up in that some of the girls um, didn't know what to say because they disagreed with her. They thought their autism diagnosis was awesome. And they, they thought it was great that they had autism, but they didn't know how to again, it goes back to that agree to disagree. They didn't know how to bring that viewpoint across. So um, I'm glad that the family brought that to my attention. And the following group, we actually had a conversation and I sat down with them and created more of a hands-on activity to help them understand more their autism and, and how um, even though they all have autism, it's, their, it's very different in each of them. So that was um, what we did. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that's very helpful. I always think back to that Stephen Shore quote that if you've met one person on the spectrum, you've met one person on the spectrum, that everyone is going to be different. So I, I understand how difficult it is for you to, to give us a broad overview uh, in a presentation like this because everyone will be different. Um, Those are we have, examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can we move on to that last section for. Yes. Um, what about girls who don't want their friends to know that they have autism and how can they advocate for themselves if they're not willing to share that information yet just before you move on to that section um yeah that's a hard one i think that that's a conversation that doesn't stop um and i think that it's continuing to that might be more where a professional is involved to talk you know why is it that girl's not accepting of her autism um, this one in particular had said that because she had heard um, people using, throwing autism around as an insult and in a, in a derogatory way. So, um, you know, even just practicing ways of how you could respond in that situation. Um, we, we role played, like if somebody said to her, cause she doesn't want people to know. So we role played, you know, what if somebody says, oh, what, you got autism? So that she knew how to respond in that situation. Um, again, I think that's, that's going to be that's going to be individualized nice okay thank you i'll let you finish this slide and then go back to more questions okay so um how to support girls with finding friends so social groups are that are specifically geared to girls um unfortunately there's not a lot of these around and that's because there's more research is needed um i've I think part of the challenge of creating social groups specifically for girls is, is finding the right um, candidates and the, and the right group. I don't put my group together just based on age, but it's based on cognitive and communicative abilities and age and interest. And then the other factor is location. So um, it's, you know, and I've also had families who have told me they're interested, but unfortunately the, the day and time doesn't work. So I think that that's a, a challenge um, in creating those groups. And I think that um, like folks that are running social groups, that they're recognizing that need is there. It's just simply trying to find enough participants, which can make a challenge. Uh, there is girls group that's a local um, Vicki Ryan runs it and Brock can provide more information about that if not everybody knows but there's chapters around um, BC and they it's free and um, it's for all girls of all abilities and so that's also an option to try to make those connections 
Uh, you can also talk to your local school. I don't know if you guys are familiar with like lunch bunches, but basically um, it would be like a group specifically for girls. So I've had kids where we have like, we've done crafting connections or um, what else did we do? I don't know, a board game group where whatever it was that was of interest to my female client and then what might be a draw of her female peers within her class so, to build those connections. And then that was usually run, it's been run by the, the child's like EA or ABSW. Um, sometimes the counselors have run it. Um, and I think even in older high schools, the LSU or, um, resource teacher has offered to put something like that together. Um, the other piece is maybe just find activities of interest and build on that. So if your daughter's into art, maybe find some art classes that she can participate in or dancing. I th the one key piece, though, is that just because she's in dance with other girls doesn't mean she's necessarily going to connect with the other girls in dance. I know from myself being in dance, um, there was always, you know, there's the time right before class starts where you make chit chat for the 10 minutes. And that's when you're connecting with other girls and socializing. So if your daughter needs that kind of go between person um, to support her with making those connections, you know, you might, you or your BI or someone who can support her in that situation might be the person who hangs out with her in the dance room. Um, before dance because once she's actually dancing there's not going to be that same level of opportunities to make those social connections um, I've had reports that like girl guides and brownies are really great because they do allow for parents or whichever adult in her life can help her um, can volunteer and be there it's it's totally fine for her to be there um, if she's into sports maybe whoever the person is that um, can support her with building those friendships is like a coach. So I think it's finding ways um, th that she can make these connections. But I think the key piece is, is that she may need the adult facilitator to help build and establish those friendships. Um, help her plan and join events. Again, some of my girls who really struggle with executive functioning, you know, oh yeah, there's a swim club happening at school yeah, I'm really interested. I want to join. But then there's no follow-up. There's sort of like, well, it'll, I'll, I'll find out when it happens. Whereas she might actually have to go and seek out the teacher who's planning it to um, get the information and find out what's needed of her in order to join. So um, if your daughter does struggle with those executive functioning skills, that you, she may need your support in that regard. Keeping in touch, right? Out of sight, out of mind, especially for girls who are texting. Um, you know, if your friend texts you and one of my girls was like, oh, yeah, she texted me, but I'll see her tomorrow in math. Well, she texted you, even if it's like, what's up? You still need to respond right away so that you can maintain that friendship. If you don't respond, it's helping her understand, well, how, you know, your friend is thinking that you're ignoring her. This is what's going to impact your relationship. So really helping her be on top of her texting. And it might require um, setting texting time, like in her schedule, so that she thinks of it um, and can keep on top of it. And then you might have a daughter who's constantly texting <laughs> and might be sending tons of emojis and, um, you know, nonsensical texts. So helping her come up with, like, how to respond to certain texts. Um, one of the things I've done with my girls is where we've just texted each other in the same room. And then what I do is when I get a text, I can actually sort of say what my thought process is. Oh, I, that text doesn't really make sense. I don't really understand. And then she can quickly um, uh, adjust it or, or fix it so that it makes more sense to me. So again, that's just a really brief overview on how to support girls with finding some friends. Let's see if there's any questions. So considering we're all homebound right now, how do you sustain these connections, especially with um, school possibly being canceled for who knows how long? Um, <clears throat> I'm actually looking to see, I'm, I'm kind of excited. I was really disappointed initially because I had girls, all these girls groups planned for the spring semester and thought that I was going to have to cancel them, but I'm actually going to be looking to do online 
so, so social connections in that regard. So if your kiddo is signed up for a social group, maybe even seeing if the option um, can be done through over video. Um, otherwise, if you're, if you're not set up in that regard, maybe even setting up online social connections with peers from school. And um, if conversation is, is hard, then you might set up like your daughter, granddaughter, and a friend doing the same thing. So maybe they're both coloring and then you set up a video so that they can still see and chat with each other. Or there's lots of, if they're into drawing, you could do um, follow a drawing YouTube video. Both of them are doing it at the same time. Or maybe they both like cooking, so they're both making cookies at the same time. So what I'm trying to say is like set them up with an activity and then they still are able to have that conversation without that being the focal point. Texting, really encouraging your daughters or granddaughters to reach out and text to other girls if that's possible. Um, I put phone calls here with a question mark because I wasn't sure if kids do that anymore. I don't know if people phone anybody. But even working on that piece, right, maybe this is a good time to work on phone etiquette. Uh, if your daughter does have a regular check in person already, uh, whether that's a counselor or a professional or um, grandma, maybe she has daily check, she talks to grandma daily and grandma's the person that she really connects with, I would highly suggest that you continue those check ins, whether it's um, through telehealth support, whether it's, you know, you're doing video conferencing, um, it's a regular text with that person once a day or, or video or phone call. Um, the other piece that I suggest right now, and that's not just even for girls with autism, but for everybody, is creating some kind of consistency in your home or um, a schedule. I know a lot for my kiddos and myself even, I've gotten quite anxious with these sort of days that just one day leads to the next. <laughs> so, so creating some sort of schedule so that she's, she knows what she's supposed to do throughout the day. So those were my suggestions. Um, I think maybe you, now we could do time for questions. Yeah, are you still taking on more um, people with your groups? And if so, what are the age groups and how would people go about uh, signing up? Um, so pre-COVID-19, <laughs> I was running two groups called Sister Squad. So that was ages, um, I have to double check, but I believe it was about 12 to 15, um, one in Cloverdale and one in New West. My Cloverdale one is full. I do have room in my New West group. Um, and then I was also starting a younger group for girls between eight to 11. And that one is still um, has space. And that one was happening in Cloverdale. Now with COVID-19, I'm going to be doing video conferencing. Um, as it's new to me, I'm going to say the sister squad is full because I'm going to be um, figuring that piece out. But um, the younger girls group, the 8 to 10 I, or 11, I would consider um, adding more if, if families are interested in going about the video conferencing. I do require, usually it's an in-person assessment, but it would be some sort of video assessment just to make sure um, it's the right fit for everyone. And, and who knows, maybe this will be a pilot project and there'll be more video conference style social groups post COVID-19. So that's always a possibility too. So um, families are welcome to email me or um, check out my website. And I don't know if that's something that could be sent out to families. Yeah, so we'll loop in uh, your website and your email uh, into the bottom okay, of perfect. the recording of the presentation as well so that people can see all of the resources that you've mentioned during the time. Perfect. Um, there's one question I'm not sure if you would be able to answer or if Stella, if she's still on the line, she'd be able to answer. Uh, there is a program, the Superflex. Yes, okay, thanks Stella. There's the Superflex program. Um, are there other programs that teaches social skills geared toward girls uh, that you would recommend? I know you had mentioned that there aren't that many, but just if you know of any other ones that are out there. Yeah, most of the programs, um, I mean, the research is more based on either a mix of gender or mostly boys. Um, I'm not familiar with peers, but I'm, that could be um, somebody, like I would talk to a professional who runs peers to see if that can be adapted and um, specifically for girls. 
I don't run a specific, um, I don't follow a program. I take sort of pieces that I feel is the right fit and I individualize based on the girls that I work with. Um, often I'll go in with a plan and that'll be thrown out the window because <laughs> the kids will come to the group with um, something completely different that needs to be worked on. If you're working on specific skills, um, like social thinking skills and understanding, I think those can still be, depending on what skills you're like body, but I'm familiar with some of it. Um, you could probably continue to work on that whether, regardless if they're boys or girls. Um, I think that it's just really making sure that those other pieces that I sort of discussed earlier are, are included, like especially the emotional piece and, and understanding okay. how to communicate that effectively. And so at this point, like <laughs> how can families practice some of these skills when they don't have like friends readily available? Sorry, when they don't, oh, friends readily available? Yeah. Um, I would, yeah, so I think that talking, again, talking to your other professionals who, like, an, whether it's an SLP or a BC or a counselor, who can um, give better assessment on where your daughter is with her conversation skills, um, you know, other, other aspects, her social thinking skills, her inferencing skills, those can be broken down and you can start start to build those skills the key piece though is then generalizing it okay well thank you so much for being able to take the time uh to do this it was very very helpful um, thank you for having me for anyone else that has more questions uh if you can feel free to get in contact with autism bc uh, all of our information services are still operational for this whole time. We're very fortunate in that manner uh, that we are able to keep our staff uh, on and be able to continue to support and connect and empower the autism community. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Do we just sign off now? <laughs> yeah, we can sign off. <laughs> okay. It seems okay. like it's just me and you, Brock. <laughs> okay. No worries. Uh, yesterday I ran a campfire uh, and there was no one in the audience. And I was like, this is the weirdest thing ever to be able to move around and no one is interacting with me. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, I'm not getting that nonverbal feedback. I don't know how to adjust myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. okay well, thank thanks. you. I'll be in touch. I'll send you some of the. Uh, the Zoom links and things. Okay, sounds great. Thanks, Rock. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now. I don't know how to leave. Uh, ah, got it. Okay, more.